Hi, everybody. Welcome to worship here at First Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Tim Bees. Now, of course, pastor isn't my first name. That's my title. But uh, it's good to have you here. This is the fourth Sunday in Lent. Uh, we're looking at a series on the Apostles' Creed. Uh, this is, I think, uh, week 11. Uh, we'll be talking about forgiveness of sins today. So, I hope that doesn't turn you off, but uh, we're here today, and that's what we're looking at. Uh, just a few announcements for you as we kind of get moving here. We're looking at a, a few things that are going on. Uh, we just sent a letter out to everybody in our church network uh, for the America for Christ offering through our denomination. That's one of our four uh, main uh, offerings that we take for mission offerings. Uh, and I just want to shout out right now that I don't think I've ever said this, but our last uh, major offering, which we did in January, I believe, was the Retired Ministers and Missionary Offering, RMMO. And I just want to thank you because we exceeded our goal and we uh, received over $1,000 towards that offering. So thank you very much. Uh, I hate to make it sound like we're always asking for money. I don't think we are. There's only four main offerings every year, but now we're looking at America for Christ, which our denomination uses for discipleship. So the money that you send us or provide for that will go toward uh, scholarships for kids who want to go to seminary, um, uh, school supporting of schools. There's discipleship uh, programs in uh, local community centers around the country, things like that. And you can look at the FBC at home. We'll have a little more in that each week about what are the ministries that America for Christ is supporting this year. So um, just to kind of let you know that's going on and you should be getting uh, an envelope in the mail that'll give you some direction on that. I also want to let you know that uh, the uh, the, on Good Friday, there is going to be uh, the 110th annual Good Friday service uh, down at uh, St. Luke's United Methodist Church from 12 to 3 p.m. as they go through the seven last words of Christ. And uh, I'll be preaching the first word, uh, Father, forgive them, which starts at 12:15. It'll be uh, you'll be able to see it, I think, online through Zoom, uh, but you'll, it's also a live event with, of course, uh, safety precautions on that. So just kind of let you know that there's something happening on Good Friday. Of course, Monday, Thursday, the night before that, we'll be having our uh, Monday, Thursday service here in, in our sanctuary. We will not have a broadcast of that, uh, but we'll, we'll do a live one here. Uh, so you're invited to come, but again, we'll social distance and wear masks. Um, and then lastly, uh, we're in our last two weeks of our Mark reading uh, through Lent. Uh, we'll be looking at chapters 13 and 14 this coming Thursday. Uh, if you're interested, and even if you haven't attended any of the others, just email me. You can find my email on our website, and I'll send you the link uh, for Thursday evening. We do that from 7 to 8. We really try to keep it within that hour. Sometimes we go over a little bit, but... Uh, those are the things that are going on right now. Um, just wanted to kind of let you know on that. We thank you for your support. Just tuning in to watch this. Um, we thank you for your financial support. We've been really faithful through this COVID. Uh, that's been a wonderful thing. And now let's light the Christ candle. Uh, again, I say this every week, and I say, I say this every week, every week too. Uh, but we light the Christ candle symbolically because uh, if Jesus isn't here, there's no sense in us doing what we're doing. So um, we believe heartily that the Lord is in our hearts, but he's also in this place gathered with his people. So that's why we uh, light that every week. Let's, let's pray and uh, ask him to bless our worship service here. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, getting us together um, you're the source of, of all truth and grace and wisdom and mercy. And uh, we're talking about uh, forgiveness today, Lord. You're the model of forgiveness. Uh, what the Bible tells us is that people 
have a history of rebellion against you, of iniquity and sin, of turning their back on you, of not listening to you, of being oblivious to you, of going our own way, and yet you continually forgive us and, and woo us and draw us back into relationship with you. And ultimately, you did that through Jesus Christ. Um, people need to respond to Christ in faith, of course, but it's through there that we receive ultimate forgiveness. And then, amazingly, Lord, um, all our sins are forgotten. I just I, That just blows my mind. Uh, all our sins are forgotten. They're not remembered. Um, Lord, we pray that we could do that. We pray that we could forget the wrongs that have been done against us. Um, you've called us to be also people who forgive. Uh, it's a little harder for us to put away the, th the hurts that have come against us. Some of them we can do and others, I guess, will struggle through our whole lives. Um, but we pray for your help, and we ask you to be with us here um, in this service. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all say amen. So uh, we got a song coming up for you right after this, and then we have a string of videos about sin, and then I'll be back to read scripture. So I'll see you in just a bit. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, as Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as
as snow Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow He washed it white as snow I'm not always easy to see, but that doesn't mean I'm not always around. I'm around every corner, I'm at your home, I'll be at your work, I'm even at your church. But you don't have to look for me because I'll find you. I am sin. tell nobody about me. Besides, we got a good thing going. You trapped. Nowhere to go and no one to turn to. You actually think people could forgive you? <laughs> Don't worry, your secret's safe with me. Some might say I'm only interested in the big things, but that's not the case at all. I love the little white lie. I encourage the second glance at that girl. I hope you take that extra drink. One little compromise. Sometimes that's all I need. I am Sam. I sound good. I smell good, and I look good. Just when you think you've had enough of me, I draw you back in. Think you can break free from me? Don't be so sure. I am singed. The younger you are, the quicker I pounce. And the older you get, the more tricks I've got. The more naive you stay, the easier I ensnare. And the wiser you are, the more sly I become. The stronger you get, the more I attack. I am sin. I celebrate diversity. Man, woman, black, white, young, old, rich, poor, I don't care. I seek all equally. I devour all wholly. It doesn't matter who you are. I am going to kill you. I am sin. Well, I hope you enjoyed those. I mean, I I don't know if enjoy is the right word for that. When we see a string of videos about sin, I thought they were kind of cool, and I didn't think we could just do one. So I believe there's six of them in a row, if I remember, which would make sense. You can't have seven because seven is perfect number, so it has to be six. Anyway, um, forgive me for being flippant about videos on sin. Um, our scripture this morning comes from the Old Testament, the uh, book of Exodus. Uh, chapter 34, verses 5 through 9. Uh, this is uh, a new copy of the covenant that's going on in this chapter. Um, so I'm going to read, and you can hear the word of the Lord. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, that him being Moses. And he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish, I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren the entire family is affected. Even children in, their, in the third and fourth generations. Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and worshiped. And he said, O oh Lord, if it is true that I have found favor with you, then please travel with us. Yes, 
This is, a stub uh, this is a stubborn and rebellious people, but please forgive our iniquity and our sins. Claim us as your own special possession. Now, this is, again, the fourth Sunday in Lent, and the creed that we are looking at this morning is, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I'll be right back. we got the Apostles' Creed coming up, so see you in a bit. You've had the Apostles' Creed now for 11 weeks. I hope you're not getting too tired of it. We're, I don't think we are here. So anyway, I, I just think it's a good thing to do for us. I think it's a great uh, declaration on our part of saying uh, all the things the world pushes at us to say, this is what you have to believe or this is what you have to do. The, the church created a creed that says, no, we don't. This is, this is the foundation of our life. So that's really what the creed is all about is it kind of gives us this uh, uh, basis for our faith, uh, at least the significant parts. This, is, again, is our 11th Sunday in this 13-week series on the Apostles' Creed. And each week I'm, I, I'm speaking about the Creed, but I'm also finding Scripture of which the Creed is built upon because we're, uh, the real authority comes from the Scripture. The Creed is, is shaped from Holy Scripture it has no real authority on its own except for what it gathers from Holy Scripture. So that's why today I'm looking at Exodus 34. But uh, it's just interesting to me as I was thinking about this week that here we are 11 weeks in and this is the first time we're talking about sin. I mean, do you realize that? This is the first time sin has been mentioned. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I want to be careful here, but so much... In, in, a, in like on a weekly schedule, we'll talk about sin in a sermon. It'll pop up. Maybe not. I mean, but that seems to just be this really important topic. And yet here in the creed, we don't get to it till week 11. And I think it's really interesting. So what do we get before that? Uh, we get to God. Uh, we get to Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, uh, you know, uh, who's suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, buried, ascended, right? The Holy Spirit, and then the communion of saints, the church, and now we're ready to deal with sin. And in fact, we're dealing with sin, but not really directly dealing with sin. We're really dealing with forgiveness today. So there, there is this, this reality, I think, that no one really cares about sin or forgiveness until they have an understanding of the Trinity. I, there has to be some understanding of God's authority, and as Christians, we believe in a Trinitarian God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So there is this reality that as it, as it unfolds about God, that's when we start thinking about, how do I relate to God? And now we start getting into thoughts of sin, and we start getting into uh, the issue of forgiveness. I was watching an interview this week with Tim Keller, 
because uh, he just had a new book come out and this person's reading them and they were talking about who's this book for and they got into this conversation about successful New Yorkers who would come uh, to his church and um, the interviewer mentioned, you know, we have folks who come to our church who they just don't get salvation. You know, they, they're like, okay, I know God, but what do I need to be saved from? Because their, their life is so successful they feel like they've made it. What, what is it I need to be saved from? They can't see uh, what scripture tells them. So uh, I, I really think you need the intervention of God to really start unpacking sin and then your need for forgiveness. But anyway, uh, just find that interesting. So we're going to look at, uh, the way we're going to do this today is we're going to look at God forgives. Uh, what does God forgive us of? And then uh, what's the platform of forgiveness, which I believe is the church. So those three things, hopefully I can do this in some kind of logical order. Those who, of you who know me best know that I'm mostly illogical. Um, but anyway, we'll go. Uh, so number one, God forgives. Um, sometimes we read or hear th this phrase that the God of the Old Testament is the angry curmudgeon God you know, that, that uh, grandfather of yours who's kind of a, a loner. That, that's the God of the Old Testament. But then we get to see the God of the New Testament. He's just loving because of Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to find out this morning in this text in Exodus that that just blows it out of the water. That's just false stuff. Uh, so uh, what we learn here is that God forgives. Listen to what God says in verses 6 and 7 here. The Lord, this is God speaking, he's speaking to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and, and transgression and sin. Again, this is a revelation from God to Moses and the people of Israel about God's character. This is God revealing his character, and look, he's not like a human like me. I could say stuff like this, you know, hey, I'm, I'm Tim, I'm the Baptist pastor, and I forgive all iniquity for generations. Look, I'm lying through my teeth if I say that, okay, because I'm a human. I'm a stinking human, man, I'm, and I got sin all through me, man. I, I, I try my best. I'm saved by grace and all that, but this is God here saying, this is God saying, this is who I am. Uh, slow to anger, uh, merciful, uh, gracious, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for, th for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So just, let's just be clear. When you get to the 2,000th generation, that doesn't mean suddenly God changes. Basically, in this statement, it's like, this is who I am. Deal with it. I'm not changing. Okay? That's what this statement is all about. Uh, and, and we have to start, when we start thinking about God, we've got to start with this statement. We've got to deal honestly with this statement. This is who God is. So those disturbing incidents in the Old Testament where you're like, wow, how do we handle that? Uh, let's just be clear, you, you have to temper whatever that thing that disturbs you with this statement, because this statement is true. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I'm saying you got to really hold on to this statement about who God is. So let me just stop here for a minute. Let me go down a rabbit trail. Here, goes, here I go becoming illogical here. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this is how God is? Do you believe this is who God is? Do you believe this is the way God relates to you? Old Testament, New Testament God, I don't care. I mean, New Testament God's Jesus Christ. It's the same God. Uh, it, it's, it's a new revelation, but this is the God that's behind the whole thing. He, he, is, uh, he is a caring, loving, merciful, forgiving God. And of course, the greatest manifestation of this God is in the character of Jesus Christ, which again, we see in John 3.16, I'm going to read it because in this stage of my life, I'll leave something key out, which we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, uh, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have 
eternal life. So that phrase really tells us where God is at. He loves us. But he sent his son, and his son loves the father and obeys the father. And we read in the Gospels as he walks through Palestine that he has love and concern and compassion on the broken people he comes across because the heart of Jesus is like the heart of his father. He's a forgiving God. So what, is, what does forgiveness mean? I came across this definition. Forgiveness is releasing someone from their wrongs fully, freely, and forever. Let me say that again. Uh, forgiveness is releasing someone from their wrongs fully, freely, and forever. This is an amazing gift that we get from God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Hebrews, uh, we read about the superiority of the covenant that comes to us through Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ is the superior high priest to all the high priests that had come before for a whole lot of reasons. But uh, mainly, uh, the book of Hebrews is telling us that Jesus has now superseded the temple complex where all the sacrifices were done because he is superior to all of that uh, ritual. And we're told that through Jesus, our sins and our lawlessness, uh, yes, that's us, by the way, uh, are, they're forgotten forever. Just hear this for a minute. Uh, the Holy Spirit declares, this is the new covenant that I will make with the people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working as we come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. I was kidding around before about myself. So let's think about this. I, I have yet to meet a person who wants to forgive, who isn't struggling with getting the thing out of their head, the picture of the wound that was given them or the occurrence that happened so that they can forgive. You can forgive, you can ask forgiveness, or you can forgive someone who's hurt you. People have a real hard time forgetting what they were hurt by or what that situation is. And they'll probably won't, I don't know that it's even a realistic expectation to, to lay that on someone. I know there's some scriptures in the Bible that kind of point us in that direction. But God, he's forgotten it. I, I don't know how that happens, but it's telling us here, if nothing else, what it's telling us is it's not held against us anymore. Not just the sins in the past. When you come to Christ, here's the cool part. Not just the sins in the past. The stuff you haven't even done yet. I mean, that, okay, that's awesome. Sign me up. Sign me up. I mean, I, I, that's awesome. Listen to what the Heidelberg Catechism says, I love catechisms, I'm into that right now, and this would be a reformed one, but uh, it says it this way, and of course the Heidelberg is question and then answer, that's how it teaches doctrine. So the question is, what do you believe about concerning the forgiveness of sins? And then the answer is that for the sake of Christ's reconciling work, God will no longer remember my sins or sinfulness with which I have to struggle all my life long, but that he graciously imparts to me the righteousness of Christ so that I may never come into condemnation. Oh, man. I am never in condemnation before God. Wow. So what does God forgive? We see there's three aspects of sin here in this text, and the wording could change depending on which translation of the Bible you're using. I happen to be using the New Living Translation right now. There's three things, iniquity, rebellion, and sin. All right, they're all pointing in the same direction, and yet there seems to be some, uh, re or, you know, some boundaries in it. So what, what's iniquity? Uh, from what I've heard, this is a premeditated choice. There, it's, it, it is thought about. Uh, it's kind of planned out. 
and there's a refusal in that planning to repent. You might know it's wrong, but there's this kind of refusal to repent. Maybe the best example of this would be the David and Bathsheba situation where the kings go off to war and David is up on his roof and he sees Bathsheba and of course this thing unfolds into a torrid relationship and then uh, Bathsheba gets pregnant and uh, David says, oops, this isn't good, I'm gonna be found out. So he calls Bathsheba's husband back uh, from the front lines and then tries to get him drunk and have him sleep with his wife but he won't do it and then he basically sends him back out on the front and tells the general, hey, when you're attacking the wall, back off so this guy gets killed. And that's what happens. So he basically, David murders the husband and then ends up uh, taking Bathsheba uh, into his household. You have to think about that for that to be carried out. That's, that right there is iniquity, all right? Now he does confess when he's confronted, but that's iniquity. The other one's rebellion. Some translations might say, transgression. This is more of, there's really no thought involved. This is kind of a gut reaction in the moment. Uh, this is me right here, okay? Uh, I've, I've got these inner barriers, and if somebody wants me to cross it, my gut reaction says, I'm not going to do that. And it's just rebellion, man. It's just rebellion. And uh, But our rebellion wouldn't be against people. Well, it could be, but ultimately our rebellion is against God and what God really wants us to do. Oh, Tim, you got to forgive. There's no way I'm going to forgive. That's rebellion. You're not thinking about it. It's just a gut reaction right there. And then the last one uh, is sin. And the best definition I can come up with in that is this idea of missing the mark, that, there's, that, that we understand there's something we should be striving toward, but we miss it. We're not hitting it. Forgiveness. I, I should be a forgiving person. Man, I'm missing the mark on that, right? So that's kind of what's going on. So let me, but I, again, I'm, I'm going to refer to a book by Tim Keller called The Reason for God. He's got a rich chapter in there on sin. What do we do with sin? And he quotes uh, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, and his, uh, he has a small book called The Sickness Unto Death. And uh, let me just say, so he describes sin in this way. He says, sin is... In despair, not wanting to be oneself before God. This is sin. That in our despair, we don't want to be ourselves before God. It's like dating, okay? When you're on those early stages of dating, before you actually grab that person that's going to be your spouse, and that's usually after the wedding, you put a false sense. You don't really want to be who you are. Oh, we talk about being... It's genuine, but at the same time, we kind of play this game that, you know, we don't want to burp in front of them. We don't want, there's stuff we don't want to do, right? Because you don't do, well, I guess some people do. Maybe things have changed. I'm looking at my younger tech guy. I don't know what goes on anymore. But I know when I was dating Claudette, you know, there's just things you don't, you, you try to hide that as if people don't know this is what humans do, you know? But anyway. So this idea that Kierkegaard says is sin is, it's in despair, we are in despair, not wanting to be oneself before God. We recognize that we're already in despair, and yet we hold back from being ourselves before God. Then Kierkegaard says, faith is that the self in being itself and wanting to be itself is grounded transparently in God. So instead of holding ourselves back from God, uh, faith means we are totally into God. We are, we, our, our identity is in God. We're not holding anything back. These are what the Psalms are. You read the Psalms, these, these, these poems of hurt and transparency that just go. And I think sometimes we're embarrassed in church if we read a Psalm because they're so personal and intimate. Um, but that's what faith is. So then he goes on, he so sin is the despairing refusal to find your deepest identity in your relationship and service to God. Sin is seeking to become oneself, to get an identity apart from him. See, this is more than doing right or doing wrong. This is the essence of sin. We are seeking an identity apart from God. We were made for God. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God. We, we were made for God, and yet here we are denying it. According to the Bible, 
the primary way to define sin is not just the doing of bad things, but even the making of good things into ultimate things. Uh, what do I mean by that? It is seeking to establish a sense of self by making something else more central to your significance or purpose and happiness than your relationship with God. So where do you get happiness? We're talking about sin. This is what God forgives us from. Where do you get happiness? I was just talking to my tech guy that today that I'm at... I was at the doctor and they asked me how tall I am. I said I'm 6'3", and then they measured me, and I've been 6'3 since uh, seventh grade. They measured me and I'm shorter now. And I kind of kiddingly said, oh my gosh, I'm not 6'3 anymore. That's such a powerful identity for me. I'm a tall guy. But then you know, I'm gonna retire at the end of the year. I won't be a pastor. The pastor identity has a strong pull on my heart. Who will I be once I retire? You know, I, I don't think I'm in sin on this, but this is kind of what's going on here. Where does our happiness come from? Does it come from your position at work? Well, most of many of you would say, no way, right? <laughs> you grit your teeth or whatever. But what is that thing? You know, your musicianship, your education, your kids, how do they behave? Sometimes your kids don't behave and you're embarrassed because suddenly they're their ill behavior reflects on you, and if they're doing well, then you're happy with who you are. And if they're not doing well, suddenly you become inferior in your own eyes. There's something bef between you and God, and, and that something is really where you're getting your identity. That's really sin, this idea that we were completed. Um, what was the money? Uh, there's a movie where uh, Tom... Uh, what is this? I can't think of his name. He says, talk, turns to his girlfriend and talks about his love. And says, you complete me. Well, God completes us, okay? Let's just be real about that. Uh, so moving on here, C.S. Lewis adds um, that sin is not simply doing bad things. It is putting good things in the place of God. So the only solution is not simply to change our behavior, but to reorient and center the entire heart and life on God. So I just spent a few minutes talking about a deeper idea of what sin is. It's not just so much, oh, I did this, so I need to be, have be forgiven. But there is this core, deep reality of sin in our lives. That, and that, that's really what we need the forgiveness for. And then all these other things are just manifestations of that inner, deeper sickness and brokenness. So... So God forgives sin. That's what he forgives, okay? That's deep stuff. I hope I didn't lose you. Uh, so the next one is God forgives sin, but, okay? So God, being, a right, being righteous, however, can't just play off our sins. Uh, can't just let us off the hook. Uh, he's provided us with a way of forgiveness, which comes through Jesus Christ. But listen to the rest of this verse in Exodus 34. Maybe you don't want me to read this, but uh, it is somewhat disturbing. I'll be honest with you. It reads, uh, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected to the third and fourth generation. I think this is really hard to hear. I believe a number of years ago, we had a young couple coming to the church, and I knew the wife more than I knew the husband, and I, in a sermon I preached on this, and I can't remember what I said, I think it really disturbed her, and she never came back to church. I don't know if that for sure, it's just the sense I had, and she had two young children, and she really struggled with this idea that stated here in, Gen in Exodus. Uh, it tells us that while God is gracious and forgiving, that God's heart is turned against sin. Uh, one person I heard this week said, God hates sin. You know, I've been so programmed not to use that term, hate, but I do think it, I, I do think it applies. Uh, and I think to some extent, this wrath is really hard for us to understand, this idea that, that this wrath that God has against sin. Now, again, as I'm trying to talk, this sin isn't petty stuff. 
You know, if we're talking about replacement of God as the source of our happiness, our identity, and replacing it with something else, that's, that's deep stuff. That's not petty. That, that, that's really important uh, when we refuse our creator to be the, the center of who we are. Uh, it, the sin roots itself in our very identities, and it poisons us, um, but it poisons those around us, those most dear to us. You know, we hear people say, you know, I, I'm free to do this as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. As if we even know uh, the collateral damage of the things uh, that we do that we think we're just hurting ourselves. Look. Um, when I served on foster care review board, can I just say that a lot of times the reasons kids were taken away from their family was because there was drug abuse and they would do hair stats on these really young kids and we would find that somehow drugs had gotten into their system, whether they were in the, just in the vicinity or whatever. And what we find out is I was with a guy who'd been serving on the foster care review board and he said, you know, I've been here a long time and I've dealt with that guy's dad and his dad's dad and what we learned is this behavior was generational. We know that poverty is generational. Let me be clear, I'm not saying poverty is a sin, but we need to recognize that we pass things on. I, I kind of kid uh, with Claudette sometimes, I think my kids picked up all my bad habits all my bad habits. They got all her good ones, all my bad ones. But it, that's the way it works. And we're fooling ourselves if we don't recognize that. There are family traits that go on from generation to generation. Addictions, alcoholism, uh, this stuff stays in a family. And it's a miracle of God when somebody breaks out of it. It's a miracle of God when someone breaks out of poverty. Because it's the air they breathe. We know that from Jim's Getting Ahead program. There is this sense that this is the atmosphere they're used to. Well, you know what? For the guilty, as, as, as God says here, folks who are not following the way, folks who have determined I'm going to go my own way, you're creating your own air, and your kids will be affected. Now, let me just say this really quickly. Ultimately, when it's all said and done, uh, my kids will have to answer to their own sins before the Lord. Uh, now, they both proclaim Christ, so I'm thankful for that. But ultimately, they are responsible for their own sins. But I've tainted them. I've tainted them by my own sinful behavior, even if I'm not aware of it. I hope that doesn't confuse uh, things here. So... God forgives, he forgives sin, he'll hold the guilty um, accountable. And then lastly, God's people are the platform for forgiveness. Think about this for a minute. Uh, forgiveness is something that is more than private and individual. Uh, it gets worked out in community. <laughs> I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the community of saints. Where, 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 where is sin worked at? It's in that community. Where is forgiveness then worked at? Well, we talked about last week, we talked about the church is the battleground of the one another's, all those one another's in scripture. Well, guess what? That, that, what you're going to work the one another's out with forgiveness. You're going to have to do it. It's a communitarian reality. It's not just between you and God. It becomes something between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ, and even folks who aren't Christian. Our forgiveness needs to overflow our little community. Mainly it needs to be there. Um, but listen to Matthew 6. This is in the Sermon on the Mount, and it's in the famous Lord's Prayer. Uh, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, and he says, Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Lord, forgive us our sins, just like we're forgiven the people who've sinned against us. 
There's an expectation that if I have received forgiveness from Jesus Christ, from God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, then I will be a purveyor of that forgiveness to other people. This is where Christianity gets hard. This is where Christianity, the rubber meets the road. It's easy to be a Christian if you just isolate yourself somewhere. Well, but we're, not, we're called into the world. We're called into the church. Forgiveness gets worked out here in this messy place called the world. And you can read uh, parables where this is presented. There's, the, uh, there's a, a wealthy landowner, and he had a guy working for him, and he was less than honorable, and the guy forgives him of his debt, and then he turns around and somebody's asking him to forgive his debt and he throws him in jail. And then the next thing you know, the master hears about what he did and he ends up throwing that guy in jail. The expectation in that parable is if you've been forgiven, you're a forgiver. You're, we don't, you know, we, forgiveness comes to me from God. It just doesn't stop. There's not a wall here that then says you can't forgive. Tim, you can just live your life and kumbaya relationship with the Lord and I don't have to forgive anybody no I'm sorry this is where it gets difficult so let me run through the matrix and then we'll close out so what's the symmetry in all this as we get this idea that we believe in the forgiveness of sins believe it or not there are some people who are Christians by the way who need to believe uh, that they can be forgiven I've run into a few over the years uh, they just they can't forgive themselves, and therefore they don't believe God can forgive them. This idea that I believe in the forgiveness of sins is strange to them. They might be able to word it, to say it, but in their heart of hearts, they live as if, you know what, God can't overcome that. This was just too horrible. They need to um, believe that they can be forgiven. So, I mean, people can be haunted by some very deep hurts and miscues. Uh, I liked what the Heidelberg Catechism said. You might be struggling with this the rest of your life, but please know this. There's no condemnation. You are forgiven. Now, pray to the Lord to help you to deal with all the collateral stuff that's going on in your head. There's others, however, who need to learn to extend forgiveness. That's the other part of the symmetry thing. I've known Christians uh, who... Um, you know, they're so rigid and they're so right. So every time they talk to somebody, it, it's a conversation of correction. It's just harsh. And it's, it's done as if that person isn't human. Um, they need to extend forgiveness to people who, like all of us, we make errors all the time. Um, I hope that's where we're at and I hope that's where I'm at as a pastor, that people recognize. And look, I'm, I'm a goof up like everybody else. And uh, I hope I don't judge. I know that that's a part of me, but I hope I don't do it a lot. C.S. Lewis again, this is what he says. Look, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. And I think, you know, Lewis just hits the nail on the head. Um, clarity. So we looked at symmetry clarity uh, I just want to say this there is no iniquity there's no rebellion there's no sin that transcends the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ right if you don't get anything else from the sermon there is nothing you or I can do that is more powerful than the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that has been poured out on the cross But let me come back again and say something else. Forgiveness is a command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We heard it there in the Sermon on the Mount. It's a command we have to forgive. We might struggle with it. We might not do it well, but it's something that we're commanded to do. Amen? Community. I'm going to quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, again, one of my favorite authors. Um, he said, the confession of sins is a breakthrough to community. In a very real way, forgiveness is not just about absolving guilt, 
but it is also a reminder of what communion with God and with one another uh, can and should be. You know, confess our sins to one another. Remember I read that? Ooh, everybody gets scary. I'm not going to confess my sins to that person. But in that confession of sins, that recognition of sins, recognition of forgiveness on the part of God, and our, and our trust in our brothers and sisters in Christ, there is communi- that's where community happens. When we can be most uh, open with one another, and I'm not saying that happens overnight. You don't walk into a group that people you never knew and just dump on them. That, uh, well, maybe you can because you don't know them and you're not planning to see them again. But if you're talking about you know, building a, lo- a, a relationship with them, you know, this is where community is going to happen. And then lastly, uh, in council, by saying the creed, we remind ourselves uh, when we come to this part that, number one, you and I have sins. We, we have it. We've caught it. And the only immunization you and I can have is Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that he pours out to us. Now, we can only be forgiven through God by Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's where forgiveness comes from. The forgiveness that's healing and, and, and empowering and all that stuff. And the more we move away from being reminded uh, of our sinfulness, or the more we deny our sinfulness, the hard, more self-righteous and judgmental we become. I, I've told you this story of a pastor I know in town who, uh, when he starts talking about the cross of Jesus Christ, he melts and cries because he was an addict. And he came to Jesus, and Jesus took that away. So whenever he thinks of the cross, he thinks of who he was and who he is now. And, man, he has just a wonderful soft heart. I love that guy. I don't see him a lot, but I love him. And that's what it is. So by saying the creed, we remind that we are indeed fallen people that have been picked up by Jesus. But we need to keep that in our mind. We have not reached the, uh, the peak of perfection. That, that's not going to happen until we go home to be with the Lord or Jesus comes again. Um, so I believe in the forgiveness of sins because it leads me and guides me to kingdom life, to new life, to a life that's different from the one I came from. Again, quoting Paul, wherever Christ is. There's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Amen? Let's pray, and uh, we'll go to a song here. Lord, we thank you. Lord, remind us every day. Don't let us forget the fact that we needed to be forgiven of our sins. Don't let us forget the fact that there is no power on earth that is more powerful than the forgiveness we receive from the cross. Never let us forget, Lord, that the day we come to relationship with you through Jesus all our sins are forgotten not just the sins of the past but the sins we have yet to commit and that you're sticking with us and forgiving us every day help that to be life changing as we say the creed together we believe in the forgiveness of sins we pray in Jesus name the great forgiver we say amen Amen. Got a song for you coming up next, and then we'll be gone for the week. Thanks a lot for joining with us. Uh, We appreciate it. I'll see you next week. God bless. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, that the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse of my soul. When I